Is this streaming in the video, Scott, or my display? Because I've got the focus right now on Zoom. Yeah, you had the focus.
Hello, everybody. This is Scott Roberts with Explore Scientific and the Explore Alliance. It's great to see everybody here today. Um, we have uh, we have a busy schedule uh, this afternoon uh, uh, that we had to take care of, and so that's the reason why the show has moved about an hour ahead of what it normally is. But um, nevertheless, uh, we are. We're excited to be here. Um, also, we have, don't forget, the 58th Global Star Party tonight, uh, which starts at 7 o'clock Central. Uh, with me is um, uh, Jerry Hubble and Annie Scarborough. And um, uh, we're, uh, you know, Jerry's got uh, a whole presentation on spectroscopy and, um, and uh, some information about an enhancement to the uh, universal firmware, firmware Firmware, <laughs> firmware. I can't even say it right. <laughs> tool, um, uh, configuration tool that uh, uh, was released earlier. Um, but first, we'll go to Annie. Annie, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. I hope everybody else is doing really good. So, yeah. so I just want to go over a little bit. Um, we we had four con, or three. We had three things that had awards um, that were given. Um, the photography winners for the galaxies. Um, and then how do you know we had um, that? We had some answers for that. And then the PMC8 surveys, uh, we are going to be announcing all those winners tomorrow on, um, on the Explore Alliance minutes. Um, we're gonna start doing that whenever um, people are announced for winners, just, just to kind of house it. So if you need to go back and look and see who won or something, then, it, then then you'll know. Of course, we send out emails to our winners as well, but just just in case, it's just to keep it in one location so we have a little bit more um, organization to that. Um, and then um, I wanna remind everybody, we still have those Bino viewers on as pre-orders. So, um, you know, we, we have, we have so much stuff coming in now. It's so exciting to come into work and see trucks it sitting and waiting to unload at our facility. And so um, the product is starting to come in. So um, if you, you know, you need to hop on that, that um, if you're wanting to get that fine over here, you need to make sure you hop on that uh, pre-order and get, and get that taken care of. Um, and then um, of course we still have, we only have four of the etched uh, 152 still, um, uh, we had a we had a customer buy one crystal, and and crystal he, laser etched mm -hmm. 152 yep we had a customer buy one and he was so intrigued with it he had a friend that he knew would love it and so he called and ordered another one um and uh is, sent that to a friend of his as a gift as a birthday gift and so um he was he had nothing to but good things to say about that. Uh, I'm going to call it a, a desk decor. I mean, it, it is so in detail. It is it's so more in, than desk decor. It's, well, I, um, but it, it's so amazing. I mean, you can just sit and stare at it. Like you can see down the telescope. It's, it's so cool. It is yeah, so cool. That's because it's, it's, really so, cool. it's taken directly from the uh, 3D CAD drawing of, yeah. of the instrument. And it's perfect down to the last detail. Yeah, and so it it's just really cool that they were able to take that uh, that CAD drawing and make that, um, you know, it's kind of like a sculpture etched in laser, you yeah, know, so within amazing. that cube. It's so, it's so yeah. detailed. So, yeah. you know, people marvel at that kind of thing. Yeah. I do too. So. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and then I want to, I know I had, I had a custom, a couple of people reach out to me this last week because they are set up on, um, on reoccurring payments, um, for our older system. We have an older system that we were using, um, you're, with you're talking about the membership recurring mm -hmm. payment, Yeah, their membership reoccurring payment. And they had, so they had an older, so we're trying to move those over to, so over to our new system. So if you have an old, if, if you have a reoccurring payment that you're paying, uh, please reach out to me. I'm going to try to email everybody and talk to everybody. So, um, but if you know, you know that you know that you have a reoccurring payment um, already set up, um, go ahead and email me at Explore Alliance um, at Explore Alliance at, at explorescientific.com. And we're going to try to 
we're going to try to move those people over to our new or to our new system. Um, and so um, we we do also have some people that have standard memberships that that we have retired. And so um, this week I'm going to try to start. Well, the beginning of next week I'm going to try to start reaching out to those and try to get them moved over as well. So um, get some get some things taken care of. But um, other than that, you know, um, we're still growing. I mean our membership is growing and it's pretty amazing. And we have so many things um, coming up. Wednesday is a completely full day with, um, with Kent, you know, first like Chronicles, Dan George is on the wing. Uh, Cameron Gillis is gonna be on. We have seven months of science with Caitlin Ahrens. And then of course we have the, uh, the next Thursday through Saturday, we have the three day um, Astronomical League Conference, Alcon. We will not be showing our regular, our regular programming. We're gonna have, um, we're gonna be a live streaming that. And so um, you, know, you can get on our calendar and click on that, click on those links and they'll be able to show you the, the schedule. Go register for the three day event. It is free. It is absolutely free. You and have a chance. Are thousands of dollars of door prices. Yes. So it's, it, it's like uh, yeah. over $8,000 of yeah. uh, all kinds of cool astro gear. So you're going to want to sign up for that. And they have some amazing speakers and event, you know, things going on there. And so you'll be able to, you'll be able to learn a lot, see a lot, and it's all virtual. And we're going to be streaming it through our, uh, through our uh, pages. And so um, I highly recommend you go do that. So we have, we're starting to kick up gear, even though, and going, um, even though COVID is a little bit fighting back um, lately, but we're trying to trying to get some events up and running and stuff like that. So, but um, but yeah, um, if anybody has any suggestions or wants to just, I've, I've had customers just call and talk to me just because. So. <laughs> I had one guy yesterday You're tell nice me to talk to. I had one guy call me yesterday. and was like, I actually just called to hear your voice. I'm like, that's so sweet. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but, but if you know, if you just if you have some suggestions or you you know you're curious about anything, just just call or email me, and I'm more than happy to try to find you an answer or figure out any you know anything you need. So, but yeah, it's, it's great. Explore Alliance is great. It's doing great. So, um, and. I got my first set of certificates mailed out. Woo! Yes. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yes. Nice. So, so yeah. Nice. So those those, those that was a long out. time coming, but uh, it but, was, they're, it, but yeah. they're heading out there. So that's really yeah. great. Yeah. So we had a, we had some kinks in that, but I, they went out Monday. So um, we'll they should start rolling in. So but yeah, everything's good. So thank you, Annie. That's thank great. Thank you. Y'all have fun. Yeah. All right, Jerry. So, um, are we? Uh, you want to start off with your uh, spectroscopy? Uh... No, I think I'll just get a quick update on our most recent release okay. for the PMC eight system. So, over the last three months since our initial release of the universal version of the firmware, which basically is the firmware that runs on the PMC eight controller, but it's we we. When we released it in April, that means there's only one version of the source code for our firmware that applies to all of our mount systems. It's not, they used to be separate versions, yeah. one for each mount because of the differences between the mounts, but now we've, we've integrated it and added uh, features to be able to configure any, any mount we release now can be configured uh, dynamically on the system. So that was the, that was the release in April. And then over the last three months, three or four months, we've we've been collecting and correcting a couple a couple of bugs that we had that were just really tiny tweaks. Nobody, they were really edge cases where most people would not even see the the problem. But we had a, uh, two or three customers that reached out to us, which we really appreciate our customers being able to push the envelope on our mount system so that we can identify these these little things that go on. Um, and if you're interested in what they were, you can download and, and see in our release notes for the updated firmware that we just released last week on August 8th. That's got the, it's the version 1.1, 1 .1, uh, 20, 20, a 01.1 is the firmware release. And with, along with that firmware, we released, uh, new versions or updated versions of the ASCOM driver that took advantage of uh, a couple of other features that we added to this release. 
and the universal firmware configuration tool, like you mentioned. Um, one of the things, one of the major changes to the universal firmware configuration tool is that now if you manually uh, configure the uh, RN131 module, which is with the big, uh, the PMC8 system that's got the silver box that yeah. comes with the G11 and the Exos2, that uses a Wi-Fi module called the RN131. If you if you you can you can get in and modify it according to an application note that we posted to configure it to connect up to your wide area network, and that information is available on the forum. Uh, if you do that and you make some changes that are not quite right and you're not sure what to do, there's a button now on the Universal Firmware Configuration Tool that lets you revert it back to our explore scientific configuration to talk wirelessly to the explore stars app so if you've gotten into that application note and you're making changes and then you decide and then you you somehow yeah, what, fumbled what it. if i mess it up i mean yeah if you fumbled it a little bit you can reach out to us and we can help you but you can also now restore it on your own without you having to call us um so that's a big thing for people that want to you know some people are there's some trepidation if you want to experiment with that, even though it's available to you to do. Some people may not want to mess with it per se, you know, but but now you've got a little more freedom to try that, to experiment with the system and, and do some things with it that you may not normally do. And that's part of what we're trying to um, trying to allow our customers or enable them to do is to explore the system, right? To explore how you can configure it and chain, make changes to it. Sure. So this is one more tool to, that allows you to recover from that. So it's just uh, like a safety net, you know, if, you, if you've uh, changed it uh, or, you know, as, as you kind of alluding to earlier that uh, you want to just go back to set, reset it back to the factory um, configuration for that, you know, then. Right. It's now just a button click away. Is that right? That's right. That's right. Great. The other, the other, big change that we had in this this release and it was it was uh, in place at in, at some level when we released it the firmware in april we got rid of the switch the manual switch that you had to do with uh with our setup software to go between either wireless or the serial port so we've got two communication channels on the pmc8 one's the wireless channel and one is the serial hardwired serial port channel uh, the previous, previous to the universal firmware, you had to choose one or the other to boot up in and you couldn't, couldn't do, you, you had, and you had to do some finagling to, to switch between the two, which our, which our configuration manager allowed you to do. But again, it was kind of a hassle. So when we released the universal firmware in April, we turned on both of those ports and made both of them available one or the other. Okay, so you could, without having to do that manual switch. So now you could start up Explore Stars and connect up wirelessly in April, or you could configure it to and start up your ASCOM driver through the serial port and use it that way without having to do this manual switch. So in furtherance of that, the most recent release we did last week, they're both available simultaneously now, which is really a game changer in terms of, of uh, capability. Now you could actually, you can actually connect both Explore Stars and the ASCOM client up at the same time. And so now you have two control interfaces that are connected on your mount to control the mount, one or the other. You can switch back and forth and dynamically without having to do anything. You basically connect up both and you can make you can slew to an object with Explore Stars, and your ASCOM planetarium program will show the updated position on the fly. And the same thing with uh, on ASCOM. If you update the ASCOM, if you slew to an object with ASCOM, or do any kind of uh, uh, motion on your system, your the Explore Stars will show it real time. Cool. So that's kind of cool to have that's two cool. different platforms that to control the mount. Um, so the use case for this is let's say you're, uh, you have your ASCOM serial, uh, cable 
connected um, out and your mounts outside and you're inside comfortably running your mount. And now you want to go outside and, and look through the eyepiece or, or check something, right? So you take your tablet outside with you and then run the mount at the same time with it connected to your ASCOM driver in the house. You can go outside with your tablet and, and run the mount and look through the eyepiece or do whatever you need to do outside and then come back in and, and, your, and your ASCOM client software shows, uh, shows where it's at even if you made an adjustment or whatever. Hmm. So it's kind of like a, it's just a way to keep up with what's going on, you know, different ways. And it's a very flexible system in that regard. You know, Jerry, I don't think there's any, I mean, after looking at all the, the flexibility of this system, I don't think there's any other go-to system you could get okay that didn't have didn't require some sort of proprietary software didn't require uh you know some sort of uh you know uh, the ability to jump back and forth between your wired connection and your wireless tablet connection i think that's amazing you yeah know? that's a new that i think that's new to the industry for yeah sure. because you could you know you're you may be tethered to your uh to your PC, but you want to go out and look at the telescope and adjust it or something, or you're going to the next object and you just grab your tablet and uh, pull up the next object if you want. And right. you need you need to switch. I, I know there's like a handshaking thing that you got to do uh, just so that the tablet will grab the control. Well, yeah. So there's a priority there's a priority command thing that goes back and forth between the ASCOM side and the Explore Star side. That's just a little thing that. Uh, it's just the point. You, know, you don't want to have any collisions. It's part of the collision avoidance system. <laughs> when you right. think about commands, collision avoidance, you know, you don't want to have colliding commands go in where they're both talking over top of each other. So one has they have to just like in air, when you're flying an aircraft and you have a pilot and a co-pilot. When you switch controls, you have a, a confirming uh, dialogue between the pilot and the co-pilot. Say, I've got the controls. Yes, I've got the controls. Okay, that's a handshaking that goes on. So that's the kind of thing, uh, and it's seamless to the user. Pa basically, you just change the mode on the Explore Stars from point to track mode, and then you've got priority command, and then you can move it around. And then when you go back to ASCOM, it'll grab, it'll look and see what the command it, mode is. Actually, it's managed by the PMC8 itself. That's cool. And when ASCOM commands come in to slew to an object, it'll say, okay, I've got command now. So it keeps track of that stuff. Very nice. Well, let's uh, let's uh, recognize some of the people that are on the program today in the audience. We've got Mike Wiesner, uh, who logged on first. Cameron Gillis is on, who will be on later tonight on the Global Star Party. Um, Martin Eastburn uh, and uh, Bergman Scooter. Uh, we've got Abdul Sat. Satter, I think is that? yes, and uh, um, Pekka Hautala is watching from Stockholm, Sweden. Um, we've got um, who else? Um, Andrew Corkill out there in California, sunny Southern California, and I understand it's sunny today, and so I'm jealous. <laughs> uh, uh, Beatrice Hines from Belgium is watching, and. Um, um and whom else do we have is that right that's probably not correct grammar whom else anyways else? Uh, yeah. right but i think that's that's our that's our audience today um uh that's at least chatting we have others that, that i can tell are watching i'm sure mike wiesner understands about command switching command between I different pilots it. so yes <laughs> that's right yep so but uh but you know the I mean some of the comments about that system, Jerry, is um, you know uh, definitely definitely uh, you know having that kind of redundancy. Cameron's bringing that up is is excellent. Um, uh, and um, Andrew Corkill knows very well uh, since he worked with me at Meet Instruments the innovations that go into go to systems, and and uh, he instantly recognizes this is, is really a first to world innovation, which is cool. Um, and he says that he loves using the PMC-8 with his iPad, he uses it all the time, which is cool. 
Um, yeah, I think it's, I think having a system to actually connected to your computer so you can see, you know, like a big screen, you know, big monitor of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, your favorite, uh, you know, planetarium software, uh, you know, watching it move along with the telescope as you're controlling it wirelessly with your tablet. It's a very dynamic, um, uh, you know, way to use uh, your, your telescope and really kind of brings that, to me, that kind of mission control kind of feeling about uh, running right. a telescope, you know, so, right. yeah. Uh, Beatrice has a question. She wants to know, does the PMC-8 have built-in Wi-Fi and is, com and is it compatible with the ZWO uh, ASI Air? Yes, yes and yes. And uh, the, I'm not sure about the Indy driver. Oh, she, uh, she said she meant, meant built-in GPS. Oh, GPS. No, 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 no it does not, not have built-in GPS. We, we get the GPS information from your tablet. Uh, you know, so if you're doing that, or we get GPS from the coordinates that you set in your planetarium software on your desktop. Right, or if your PC has a GPS receiver like we use in the observatory, we do that yeah, also. Yeah, it could be, right? Mm -hmm. That's the one thing I'm missing off of my my remote setup is a uh, GPS antenna. Uh, so they're inexpensive. They're, they're about 20 bucks, and oh, that's definitely we use a great software yeah. to do our time standard and the GPS coordinates. Uh, is uh, we use a program called NMEA Time that uh, I won't get into here, but uh, I've talked about it on previous episodes, but it's a great yes. uh, timekeeper for us. Yeah, and you need, you know, if you're doing research, you definitely need, you know, very accurate time. Yes. And yep. and go to systems also rely on on very accurate time for the best pointing uh ability so that's that is right so that's something to keep in mind you you bring up a great point scott between the two control systems they're independent the explore stars tablet application is independent of your host you know if you're using a pc or a laptop to do the ascom stuff so i see in order for the coordinates to match you really have to have a time synchronized between the two tablets now there's no i'm sure there's well you can use network time if you're on a network you could do that but there's got to be uh right now there's no automated system to synchronize the times between the two systems uh okay, that should be yes. possible i mean that i mean right now the so the way explore stars work it's it's open loop there's no commu active communications between the pc on ascom and explore stars there's no there's no communications that goes on the only guy that knows that's going what's going on is the pmc8 and uh, and again, the PMC-8 is just a motion controller. It, it doesn't know anything about astronomy. Hmm. So you have to manually synchronize the times between your tablet and your host computer to to ensure the best performance. Right. Now, some people and, may wonder why we didn't build the astronomy, um, you know, uh, algorithm guts into the mount itself. And the reason why we didn't is uh, you know we wanted to keep the uh, uh, you know the software development of software to be as flexible as possible. So you know we we left it up to the programmer to include that uh, you know that control. But what we delivered to them is is a mount that's extremely robust uh, electronics that well I mean. I can count on one or two hands out of all the mounts that we've shipped. Okay. Yeah. How many have actually come back for repair? Okay. So that I wanted, we wanted something that was really, really robust. And this is what we concentrated on extremely robust electronics, uh, you know, an extremely robust uh, motor system. You know, that's the reason we went, went to step right, and dedi right. Dedicated, uh, dedicated tasks to, to yeah. just care about, the motors in the drive. It doesn't care about anything else outside. That could be handled on other computers that we have interface to it. But right. we made it very fast and very responsive. And there's always, you know, as as people learn a system, uh, you know, there's always a better way to uh, execute an algorithm. You know, so uh, uh, you know, there's uh, you know, someone may do, uh, you know, their first time out. Uh, developing a, uh, a platform 
that that's the best it can ever possibly be. But usually that's not the case, you know, so it's nice to, uh, you know, not bury uh, in firmware that those kinds of algorithms, you know, and then force everybody else that's writing software to kind of adhere to that and work around its uh well it's not only adhere to it, but there's another there's another word for it here it means limit limit they're limited yes you are <laughs> right you right know, we adhere to an unlimited, unlimited system that. that's right yeah. so that no that limit keeps, no limits it keeps the uh system evergreen i think you know so i'm hoping that you know, 20 years from now, people are still using them and and using some really cool software to run it with. So, oh, yeah. Well, and that's the other that's so we're trying to expand the flexibility and the configurability of the system. And this is just one instance of what we just released. There's so many possibilities going forward now with this type of communication system. Yeah. Uh, and more is to come. We have ideas and and uh, we, we take uh, we get ideas from our customers on our forum and uh, we're, we're moving on. We're making it better every day. That's very cool. Great. Thanks, Jerry. So um, so let's let's learn more about spectroscopy. Yeah. So <clears throat> let me uh, start. I'm going to show you a great website. A great friend of ours, Tom Field has developed software called RSpec. I thought I had it up here, hold on. Um, and a lot of you may know Tom. Uh, let's see. I'm gonna share his website real quick for a minute. Everybody knows where it is, and um, he's he's developed a software that allows you to do analysis, advanced analysis for uh, imaging that you do with a spectrograph with a graph. Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> a spectroscopic grading, or even yeah. uh, higher end spec uh, a spectroscope or a spectrometer that, uh, and I'll give you an example of something like that. Not that. And then, um, so there's Tom, there's, that's what Tom looks like. And there's Dennis DiCicco doing an interview in 2011 with Tom. And uh, he's got, he's got a great set of videos. That's if you want to learn more about it, uh, his software and how it's used, you can use the, uh, look at his videos. And I'm going to demonstrate some of his, his RSpec software in a few minutes. Um, there he is with, um, uh, <laughs> what's his name? I can't even remember. Neil deGrasse uh, Tyson. Tyson. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> Neil deGrasse Tyson. He, he ambushed. He, Tom told me he that he photo bombed uh, Tom Fields, uh, poster. Yeah, there. yeah. Yeah. So that's a poster that Tom came up with and he, uh, talked to Neil deGrasse Tyson about That's it. cool. That's kind of cool. So, um, so that's, that's his website, and and what we use in the uh, what I'm gonna I'm gonna show you is an image that we pro and I'm gonna show you how we processed it with a with this item called a star analyzer. We've got the SA200, which is a 200 line per millimeter grading that's in our filter wheel that we take images with at the Mark Slade Remote Observatory to do spectroscopy, and uh, he talks about that. And this is an example of what a spectrum might look like with the RSpec software. And I'll, I'll show you some more. Uh, so I wanted to uh, show that. And then um, <clears throat> that that's, uh, if you just look up RSpec, R-S-P-E-C on Google, uh, you'll find his website. The other thing, so the next thing I wanna share, that's the software that I'm gonna be demonstrating. Um, I went through previous in a previous episode talking about what spectroscopy is. So this this uh, demonstration is just going to be just a hands-on thing. Uh, let's see, what else do I have here? So I want to bring up Maxim DL to show you what the FITS image is, and this is an interesting um, this is an interesting object. Okay, that I'm going to show you. 
Uh, it, might, it might not look like much here on this first shared thing that I do. I'm going to share my Maxim DL window. Now, so this is the image. It looks noisy and there's a lot of background. And, and what this was taken of uh, ANOVA last in, uh, I have to look and see what the date was. I think it was May of 2018. Uh, Victor 392 Perseid was ANOVA hmm. that, that uh, revealed itself back in May of 2018. Okay, and uh, just to give you an idea, here's here's this is, there's a lot of noise in this. Okay, a lot of background, uh, but I don't know. Can you see you see the spectrum right here? Yes. Where I'm where I'm pointing at. That's a continuous. That's kind of like a continuous spectrum from this star here. Okay, the the grating spreads the light out along this axis, and we've got it aligned vertically instead of horizontally because our declination axis is vertical. Um, and our RA axis is horizontal on this image. So when you're tracking RA, you might have some jitter or some movement in your RA axis sideways. But when you're deck, when you're, your declination, when you're fixed on, on the star, your declination does not move. There's no movement in declination for the star like you are when you're trying to correct for the Earth's rotation in RA. Mm -hmm. So we, we align the, spectra, the spectrum along the deck axis because we know there's no movement in that axis. And that allows us to get uh, to be able to do higher resolution spectrums because the lines aren't blurred. If you have motion in the deck axis, then the lines get blurred out and you don't have any, any real um, resolution in terms of that. So one of the things, so this is the raw image and you can see the spectrum is somewhat continuous and then you have this big spike here for the Nova, okay? Now, and I'll talk more about what that spike is, but just think about it right now for the next couple of minutes. What would, what would be spiked when you have a star blow up, okay? And another clue is what is it spewing, <laughs> okay? All right, so let me, let me, uh, I'm going to show you the actual spectrum now with our spec on this. And then I, uh, I've, I have spewed before. You spewed before? That's good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Unintentional. I, I Unintentionally imagine. spewed. Yes. <laughs> so, all right. So let me share my R spec. Um, I'm hoping that it shows. It may not show the other lines. Um, All right, what happened to it? Where's my R spec? Instagram. Oh, there's the main screen. Okay, I'm looking. It splits up the screen into three parts, so I'm, I'm trying to find the main screen. Okay, do you see that? Is it? Is it? Can you see the whole thing, or is it blocked off? You should see the whole thing now. Is that right? Yeah, I see the whole graph. So this is the spectrum like I showed you. So here, here's the image. Now I've rotated it 90 degrees. So you've got the star here and you've got the spectrum. The, uh, it's not really bright. Let me try, see if I can bring it up a little bit. View histogram. Oh, I think I had it up already. Hold on. So let me do an auto stretch on it. it didn't really make much difference, did it? You can see some, I don't know if it's, it's really small on your screen probably. Um, but anyway, it's stretched out. I can probably show it better. I'll go back to the Max VL and show you the line there. But you've got this bright area right here, which is actually this peak, okay? And right now I've got plotted some lines on here that are related to um, stars and are called hydrogen bomber lines, okay? So, you can see this is, I don't know if you saw it pop up. Hydrogen, this is hydrogen beta, okay? This is hydrogen gamma. Cool. That's the wavelength that it emits, okay? Or that it absorbs. These are absorption lines normally, okay? 
Um, this is, I could get it to come up, hydrogen delta, okay? And these are typically, on most stars, these are absorption lines, okay, in the star spectrum. And then, and then this is the big one here. This is the one that's peaked, it's hydrogen alpha. Hydrogen alpha is a gas, right, that people image when they do deep sky objects or nebula. They have a filter specifically for hydrogen alpha, okay? So think about this, this supernova. Look what it's doing. It's really bright. It's emitting hydrogen alpha. Cool. And that's, that's when it blew up. It's spewing all this hydrogen alpha gas. Okay. And that's why we had this peak during the Nova. So that's pretty cool that you can determine. Yeah, this is a Nova. We know it's, yeah, look how know much it's emitting. I mean, compared to the other peaks. That oh, are... yeah. It's really, it's really a lot. <laughs> the thing. So if we look up Victor 392 per, uh, Perseus. Um, I'll, I might do that here on Google here in a second. We'll look up this. We'll look up this star and see what it says about the nova. Uh, and but this is this is an example of what you can do with a simple grading on your telescope with spectroscopy. Uh, there's some tools that allow you to set these lines. So I'm gonna like um, let me stop my share. Here I can I can put up the share the Wikipedia thing on that star for you. Okay. Okay. There we go. Where'd you put it? Oh, you put it out there on the. Uh, yeah. On the chat. Yeah, I'll give it to you too. There you go. Yeah. Let me. Okay. Let me bring that up. Share it. Here we only got. We got about 10, 15 minutes here to show you stuff. All right, there it is. And I'll zoom up on it. Okay, there it is right there. April 29th, 2018. There was a dwarf Nova previously. And uh, let's see. I don't know if there's any other drawings or pictures here. There are probably something that can show similar to what I was just showing. The cataclysmic variable, which has means it's got it's a it's a two stars. Okay, where it's the uh white dwarf is is sucking off gas from the from the donor star and it basically builds up to the point where it's overwhelmed and it just throws it off okay it, it's accumulating too much and it's getting um too big and then it throws it off and it and that's when it uh bursts so uh, so is the majority of that hydrogen alpha material coming from the orbiting star it, the donor, the donor, the donor kind of it's it's accumulated by the the nova star, but it does come from the donor and it's okay. thrown off. Interesting. And it's, it's burnt off basically when it explodes. I guess you could say. I don't know if it's I burnt. Mean, I'm not sure. It's it's basically fusion. A frying right? pan on the stove it's, and it's fusing it. Pour, right. Yeah. And pour it's, some and gasoline it's onto the frying pan or right. something. <laughs> right. I'm trying. To, See if there's a good drawing that shows anything similar to what I was just showing on this. Uh, um, let me see if I, I can find something else for you, Jerry. But uh, the spectrum. So they talk about uh, spectroscopy here. I guess that can show some missing lines. Let's see. Oh. So this gives you an idea of what spectral lines uh, and hydrogen alpha is the one that it threw, it threw off. Uh, 
This is from Sky and Telescope. So that's what it shows. So I have one last thing to show uh, that I want to get to real quick before we end because we got to get off here in a minute. Um, I want to show, this is from a presentation I gave um, by a few years ago of a device that I created. It's a fiber fed spectrometer and I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'm going to go fast through this document, but uh, let me share this. And I've been through this before with other presentations on, I think on the Global Star Party, I talked about it, but I'll just give a quick overview. So this is a spectrometer that I built uh, back in probably 2011, 2012, something like that. And that's this box right here. But I wanted to show what the results are. This and this is a fiber fed spectrometer. This is what it looks like inside. Go back to that. Oh yeah, you built okay. this thing, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I I put it together. I I built this. I turned this uh, flip mirror into a cold mirror, which which basically transmits infrared light to the camera to track, and then it, up it puts reflects visible light up into the spectrometer. But to make a long story short, this thing works pretty well. Uh, I built some software to analyze the data, and then I used RSpec to import the data. And um, where's that? This is this is the spectra of Aldebaran mm -hmm. that I took with this uh, spectrometer, and you can see the reference spectra. So. So our spec has a thing, has a library of reference spectra, which is great. So any star that's out there, you can get the library uh, spectra to compare your own measurement spectra to. Okay, and that's what this is showing right here. Uh, the red is my measurement and the blue is the, the reference. Hmm. And you can see it matches pretty close. And you can see how sharp the peaks are, that's the resolution of the spectra. How, the sharper the peaks, the higher resolution that you have to, for the measurement. Uh, so that, that's basically another uh, way you can use RSpec to do, if you've got other instruments that are spectrometers, you can do measurements with RSpec on that too. There's something else, I thought I had it in here. Oh, this is what an LCD screen looks like. That's kind of interesting. I use that as a calibration source because these LEDs are the uh, actually this came from uh, uh, the you know the old LCD displays had uh, lights behind them they're uh, phosphorus lamps right phosphor mm -hmm. lamps mm -hmm. and they emit in specific spectra okay and that's what these are right so this is in the red region blue uh, green and blue. Okay, and you can see down here is the blue, that's the green peaks. There's two peaks there, which you can see there, and then the red right there. And there are specific wavelengths uh, that you can calibrate the wavelength of your spectra for. And that's what I use the panel for, to do that. So that's how that works. Um, trying to think if I've got anything else to show. I think that's it. So are there any questions about spectroscopy? Uh... Well, some people, that was a quick uh, that was a quick demonstration, of course. Anyway, we can get into it for hours on end. Oh yeah, you know, and the thing that's cool about Tom Field's uh, R spec is it's very inexpensive. This is very yes. inexpensive. I mean, there's uh, to get into. Um, you know, if you already have a camera, you already have a telescope, you just need to buy this grading, which I think costs two hundred bucks, something yeah, like $200. that. Yeah, two hundred dollars. It's a nice instrument. I mean, it's no, it's really and it more less expensive than typical filter great filters are. Right, and then and then is software, which I'm not sure exactly what it costs, but um, but I think it's also very reasonable, and you can start doing science, you know. So, yeah. um, uh, you know, and the reason why astronomers jumped to spectroscopy a long time ago is because they could finally dissect what's going on inside of stars, you know. Right. I think it was first used on the sun, and then 
on brighter stars. And then we kept making better and better equipment to um, to observe the fainter stuff that's out there, including nebula and galaxies. But I think that Tom's system also works on uh, bright nebula. Oh, uh, planetaries. Yeah. anything you can gather, you can image uh, with the grading with your telescope, you can right. get spectra of, right? Right. And the oh, other thing, cool. well, the other thing about spectroscopy, it's a fundamental, it was a fundamental breakthrough in astronomical science because at, you know, they weren't sure if things that were on the earth, you know, there's, there's a lot of mythology back then in terms of what materials are on the earth compared to what's out in space, you know, it's otherworldly stuff. You know, they didn't think the materials were the same or elements were the same, but we discovered with spectroscopy that, Helium on the Earth is the same as helium out in space and hydrogen and all the elements that we discovered on the Earth and were able to characterize are in space. And that was that was a fundamental paradigm shift in our thinking right. in terms of, uh, you know, how we relate to the universe. Right. I think the big struggle for humans over the entire span of uh astro of astronomy has been this um has been the idea that we're somehow special that we we occupy a special place in the universe that we are somehow unique and what we're finding out is that we are n not so unique and and that we're part of the rest right. of the process of the we're not cosmos. we're not a, right exactly we're not an, an unnatural part of the universe exactly we're not we're not we're right we're not a, you know we're not and i don't uh, know why humans jump to that conclusion early on but yeah. you know but we're still i think we're still climbing out of it you know so right right you know but uh well anyways I want to thank you. Thank you for this, uh, you know, this session, Jerry. I get more and more enthusiastic about spectroscopic uh, uh, observations myself as I watch you go through these things. Um, it's fun and, to play. I mean, you, you can get into it as little or as much as you want, and you can do basic stuff, learn the basics of it, and then have and still have fun uh, with it, uh, even at that level. You can discover things. Even so, one of the things I did early on with my grading in my telescope, I I actually played with the grading and pointed the stuff on the earth, you know, like a grass, you know, the colors tell the story, right? Sure. Uh, in terms of what, what elements are there. Um, and it's kind of interesting to not just look at stars and things, but also things on the earth, like the green leaves or, you know, and that's a big part of the analysis that scientists use today in chemistry. Mm -hmm. they, they analyze materials with spectroscopy, right. And, and gases and other things on the earth uh to understand the chemistry sure and uh right. it's the same it's the same basic principles that that the spectroscopic grading works that's in fact that's that one that i showed you that fiber fed spectrometer was from a chemical analysis machine and i applied it to stars that's cool very cool well folks uh we have to go uh but make sure that you tune in tonight at seven o'clock central for the 58th global star party um and until then we'll uh, we'll see you later uh also uh i'm going to give you a reminder of the uh astronomical league uh 2021 virtual event this is an event that you can sign up for you have to be signed up for it to win the door prizes uh, and there's over eight thousand dollars in door prizes you don't have to be an astronomical league member to participate so um so we will uh and that that starts on the 19th and runs through saturday so okay and uh thanks for tuning in folks and we'll talk to you later
Here's the Explore Scientific IXOS 100 equatorial tracker mount. Uh, we've got it mounted up here with a digital SLR that's got the uh, uh, dovetail plate here. We also have it kind of mounted on our extra, extra heavy duty tripod. Uh, but uh, this, this whole thing is operated remotely. You can see Ken's operating it with uh, his uh, Apple tablet here. Uh, but it'll run off a Windows tablet or an Android tablet. What do you like about this whole system, Kent? I find it very intuitive. It's very quiet. Um, like any go-to system, there are things to learn. Sure. But once you learn those things, it makes it really easy to find stuff in the sky. Sure. Now, this is running our Explore Stars app. If you're going to do astrophotography, you need to be running it with a planetarium program, hardwired computer. That's right. ASCOM so this runs program. wireless, wired, okay? It's super versatile. It not only has go-to uh, capabilities, but uh, you can also add a, um, a guide scope with an auto guider CCD type of camera onto it. So, uh, and you know, the thing that you're gonna really love about this is the price of this instrument, um, which will fit neatly into your uh, budget, I'm sure. So uh, check it out, look online, check out the specs, give us a call if you have any questions. Thank <laughs> you.